Jameson Lecture, Friday, 7th of April, 10 a.m. I think we should uh, try to begin. I want to uh, talk today about this idea of uh, schizophrenic literature. I mentioned this uh, catalog, and I guess we can pass it around uh, today. Uh, I think they've seen it probably. Um, but you may want to want to look at. I don't know that we'll talk about any of those things today, the, the bachelor machine. Um, what I want to do, though, is to review a few of these concepts of Deleuze that I talked about yesterday, um, or preview a few that I didn't talk about um, yet, and uh, show um, use those as a framework for reinterpreting some of the things we did uh, before. Um, then we'll go on to schizophrenic uh, literature where we're going to find that really there are two, uh, the, the problem remains in, in Deleuze uh, uh, <coughs> when he talks about the schizophrenic as, well, essentially the Nietzschean Superman, that is as the the, the figure of human life, the, the, the ethically valorized figure of human life of the future, and so on and so forth. Um, are we to take that, is this to be taken literally? Well, I say yes, yes, this is absolutely literal. Are we to take this, um, but of course it isn't, because uh, when you say, well, schizophrenic, you mean catatonics in the hospital zone? No, no, that's what's happened to schizophrenics in the society. The real schizophrenic is not that, but, uh, but a figure who is inside of this um, brutalized uh, schizophrenic and whose inner truth we have to disengage. Well, of course, that's a hermeneutic idea. That is, that uh, we have the appearance, the fallen appearance of the schizophrenic in our society, clinical diagnosis, pathology, medicine, and all the rest of it. And then behind that, we have the, schizo the real schizophrenic, the schizophrenic as the figure of the way life ought to be lived and so on. Well, I think uh, this is ultimately probably not a satisfactory arrangement, and we're going to find here, too, that even if we want to talk about the schizophrenic text as being, uh, as being a figure of a new kind of writing, and you understand that I use this in a kind of both a periodizing way and I assimilate this, or I think what, what it would be interesting to do if we could and we had the materials, which we don't and we don't have the time, is to show how all these things are related. That is, I take schizophrenic literature as a kind of, as uh, um, another way of talking about postmodernist literature, as another way of talking about textualizing literature or text as opposed to older forms of literary discourse. Uh, are there any other, uh, or écriture, or the, the scriptable as opposed to the readable, to use those things in part, and so on and so forth. That is, it seems to me that all those concepts are of a piece. But then, alongside of that, there is also a literature by and about schizophrenics, which is maybe not exactly that. Um, and so we have to come to terms with that first, before we try to understand the connections between that clinical schizophrenia and, um, and this new type of discourse, uh, which is that of postmodernism, consumer society, whatever you like. Uh, that's the interest for me in these great, um, in these other texts that I've proposed, and I don't know some of this I haven't really announced, but I think you know these texts anyway. First of all, the Büchner Lenz fragment, which it seems to me is the most remarkable, most remarkable description of schizophrenia that, that there is any place. And then uh, Artaud's correspondence with Rivière that I'll quote a little bit from, which is also a very important document about what this feels like from the inside, particularly as it has to do with writing and language and so on. And after that, hopefully, we'll go on to Beckett. First to Watt, as a, I think a, an example of a relatively pure schizophrenic text, and then, uh, then to the novels, to Malloy, as what comes out of that, uh, what's reformed out of that, uh, what's recontained, if you like, uh, as it comes out of that. Okay, now, to, to begin with these other uh, concepts, though, I, I want to um, suggest uh, very briefly that uh, <coughs> the parts of um, the anti-Oedipus that are particularly useful for us, uh, 
are the, uh, is this opposition molecular and molar? You remember that for them, um, the, this is an ethical and a political, uh, or a, an ethical political judgment. Uh, the molecular is good, the molar is bad. The molecular is revolutionary, the molar is fascist. Uh, the molecular is schizophrenic, uh, the, the molar is paranoid. Um, so if we, t we take it for what it is in those terms uh, and we look at it, what we see is that molecular is, um, uh, describes, designates this uh, um, involvement, this microphysics of desire as the relationship kind of pre-self-conscious, um, uh, pre-self-conscious stage in which desire is completely taken up with its immediate objects, uh, with what the Deleuze will call the flux. Uh, now the molar on the other hand uh, comes, the molar impulse comes from the other tendency or pole of the, of the desiring machines which is this, uh, this uh, whole optical illusion of the, the full body without organs that we spoke about yesterday. Namely, the sense, of, um, the sense of a kind of total uh, but purely formal unity. Uh, the body without organs, as the name suggests, has no content. It's just, it, it represents the illusion, the optical illusion of reunification. Uh, so it can exist uh, on the subjective level as being my sense of a body without organs. In other words, um, this is personal identity, right? We walk around, somebody said, you know, the only time you're ever, um, you're ever aware of parts of your body is, when, is through pain. If you assimilate pleasure to, to pain too, as Freud does, then that, then that makes sense. That is that those are the only times when individual organs, it, parts in things inside your body impose themselves on your attention, right? You know you have organs when one of them starts to ache or hurt or whatever. Normally, we have a body without organs. That is to say, we're not aware of those things. Well, then what are we, then what is the concrete reality of that? What it means is that it's just our conviction that we are a kind of unity. Uh, we have a unity of personality, a physical unity. All of that is somehow unified in an abstract way that we couldn't possibly describe, and everything else is drawn into that and assimilated into that unity. So the body without organs is a way of um, keeping us from exploding in all different directions the way the schizophrenic does, uh, in, in a molecular way. Uh, as you've seen already in, in the Beckett things or in Lentz, um, schizophrenic attention is, uh, is sort of uh, one moment after the other in which there's no necessary connection between any of those things, but where each moment is up so close that it can't be unified with anything else. That is, first you're involved in this, and then after that something else comes along, you're involved in that, and there is no real, uh, there is no unity. And so, from one point of view, uh, one's experience has sort of exploded in all directions and, and fragmented. But that's the point of view of the unity which says that, you see. For Deleuze, that's already an ideological point of view. If one could live this series of presents, you wouldn't call it fragmented because you just be in each one of them. Um, so, um, so the body without organs on the subjective side is that unification. On the other side, on the collective side, the body without organs is the socius, uh, that is to say, the empty, formal, abstract unification of the mode of production, of the social form. And uh, that is to say, for primitive man, people, uh, the body of the earth, for uh, the, the period of the state, pre-capitalism, uh, feudal society, or oriental despotism, and so on, the body of the despot, uh, and for capitalism, the body of capital itself. Now, it's clear that all of these things are phantasmatic. That is, none of them exists anywhere. How could you ever see the unity of everything? You can't. Uh, so they exist as the outer unifying limit of these things. But that's the way in which, um, that's this pole of unification uh, which uh, pulls us away from uh, molecular experience towards this sort of empty, unifying experience, which ultimately they associate with a death wish, and I think that's probably, uh, as you probably know, uh, there's a lot of reflection today on, on what Freud means by the death wish, a lot of different versions of that, and I think 
none of them are really really make any sense, but uh, uh, and no more than the original concept. But this comes as close, I think, to being a, a usable version of the Freudian death wish as any that I've seen, because it's clear that the more you sacrifice individual detail to this complete sense of unity, the less there is and the emptier it gets, and, uh, and finally you have this kind of desert that they speak of, which is, which is ultimate unity, but which is sort of death-like. Now, uh, if this is the case, then what, can, wh what does one do with this in, uh, in, uh, in the actual terms of, uh, of, of looking at texts or works of art? Well, that's why I think one can go back over uh, both the Conrad and the Lewis texts that we've looked at and, uh, and rewrite some of our findings uh, uh, in, um, uh, in, in these terms. That is, it's pretty clear from the, uh, from the materials of, of Conrad's discourse that we really have to do with an experience of flux. That is, uh, everything has broken down. Uh, the, um, uh, the bits and pieces of the outs outside world are coming in absolutely fragmented form. Um, and then we, have a pro then we have a second process, so we have an experience of the flux, which is then recontained by another impulse, which one has to think of as a kind of molar impulse, which is then to form those things back into unities. Those are new unities, of course. That is, uh, Conrad does, it's not a complete repression of this experience. When, Conrad, when Conrad's visual world breaks into pieces, um, he doesn't repress that experience and give us standard pictures of objects of the older type. No, he keeps faith with these broken fragments by reuniting them into a new set of, into a new perception, which somehow reflects this initial disintegration, and but simply pulls them together. So it's not a complete, um, uh, it's not a complete triumph of the molar. But nonetheless, one can see these two things at work. Now it seems to me there's several levels that, that one can see this on. The most dramatic one is, of course, this level of individual sense perception of the visual. Um, there is another level, though, which is that it seems to me of language. We're going to see in a minute how much the problem of language is uh, crucial in the whole schizophrenic experience. And indeed, as much as for anything else, that's one of the reasons why today in this very linguistic, obsessed, and dominated uh, thought current, why this has come to seem a very privileged kind of um, mental formation, unlike, let's say, paranoia, which is not particularly linguistic or whatever, you know. Um, uh, but uh, uh, even for Conrad, one can certainly suppose that um, one of the things that's happening in this experience of the flux is that there's a flux of language, too. That is to say, for a person for who is, who is uh, um, exiled as is Beckett, uh, for whom the language he's using is a foreign language, you already have an objectification of language, a kind of reification of language, a really opacity of this foreign language. It really never goes away completely. Uh, so you have an experience of language as things, and if things are breaking up into little bits, then one assumes this is happening to language too. Now, um, I would say that the molar, uh, this is, we're just deducing this in Conrad, because we don't really have I don't think uh, there's any place in those texts where, uh, unlike the, the level of sensations, where one can really feel that the visual is there in a state of flux, I don't think one feels that necessarily about, uh, about words the way one does when one gets to Beckett's or whatever. Nonetheless, one can at least surprise a reunifying molar counter process of work, and that would be this... Um, uh, obsessive regeneration, not only of points of view, as we said, but of spoken points of view of the, of the storytelling, of storytelling itself. As though the way you overcome this fragmentation of language is you generate a speaker, and then his discourse pulls all that back in and reunifies it as the, the bits and pieces of the discourse of a single center. And we've seen how, uh, particularly in the opening of Lord Jim, uh, each new detail sort of fatally under its own weight generates a speaker and a story and so we have a whole series of little, um, <coughs> uh, of little uh, yarn spinners of, of small kinds of centers of speech and so forth which are, which it seemed to me would then, would then in some way correspond to, to this molar kind of recontainment. Well if that's so then on the third level it's very clear what the process is. 
the, the molar impulse is Marlow. Uh, Jim, uh, on his end, stands for the molecular. Jim's experience is that of, um, uh, of all activity breaking down into their smallest parts, but which the smallest parts, as in the, is it the, 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 the Hindu fable, um, or the Buddhist fable, I'm not sure which, uh, like the onion, that's, that's what, how one is to reach the center of the personality. It's like an onion, you peel off each layer, and finally you arrive at the core, which is to say nothing at all, because nothing's there. Well, that's what Jim, that's Jim's experience of, of action, and therefore Jim's is, a, is very clearly a, mo a molecular kind of dividing experience, and um, where Marlowe's uh, is, Marlowe's function, uh, is then abstract reunification. Marlowe has to follow Jim around and then reunify, pull all those fragments back together in some way, or pull them back at least into a requirement of unity, whether one understands this, what's going on or not, whether one can make a coherent picture of it. Nonetheless, even by setting it up in that, uh, in that way as a riddle to be solved, one reunifies all that, all, all that material. So it seems to me that indeed these things do work for Conrad. Now, uh, in Lewis, I think the matter is a little bit different because it's clear that Lewis has consented to the flux in a way that um, uh, in a way that Conrad hasn't. And I don't know. I think I said the other day that, um, in a sense, that the the, uh, the division between the, the kind of imbalance in tar between uh, tar and Chrysler. Uh, is a little bit this uh, that we're talking about between uh, Jim and Marlowe. Uh, Chrysler is certainly the some kind of experience of, uh, of sequences of sensations, completely irrational successions of things, which is at least proto-schizophrenic, whatever the other things involved are. Um, and, but Tar is out of life. Tar is the observer. Tar is, uh, is, is the mind. Uh, tar wants to be out of life, and so on and so forth. So um, this um, apparent imbalance uh, would seem, on the contrary, Tar is the one who draws the conclusions from Chrysler's um, destiny and so forth. Um, it would seem then that Tar, uh, as, the, as the, the, the kind of visual artist impulse, is uh, again the, the kind of totalizing uh, pole, uh, which reconnects uh, all of the uh, bits and pieces of, um, of uh, of uh, Chrysler's uh, experience. Now we don't have any of the uh, of the later the political text, but I think um, one could uh, one could make this hypothesis. After all, Deleuze and Guattari are really talking about um, trying to have a theory of fascism. Their theory of fascism is the molar, clearly, and um, uh, I think one can at least. Uh, Make a hypothesis about Lewis's uh, Lewis's later political uh, uh, affiliations that um, uh, we have uh, a, a very profound experience of of flux and of the molecular in Lewis, which somehow is intolerable, uh, which makes recontainment of the pre-war type of the tar type no longer possible because little by little this. Uh, uh, this, 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 uh, the, the, the writing can't, uh, can't. Uh, if you come to the children's mass, you'll see that uh, the writing is no longer contained by any of those those things. That is, it is becomes sort of purely molecular, and, and thus there's a kind of um, absolute experience of, of the molecular here. Well, that ultimately this is intolerable and demands to be recompleted outside of the work by the molar, and the molar then becomes the temptation of fascism and, and the temptation of some kind of ultimate unification and, and so on. So, um, so it seems to me at least uh, conceivable that this, that this opposition has some, um, has some relevance uh, here too. Now, um, I want to go on now to, um, um, to these uh, texts of, uh, of Artaud and, Lent, uh, and Bruchner. Um, to try to, uh, so we're breaking off that use of the Deleuze description of schizophrenia, uh, and we're obliged to go back to more clinical things. In particular, I don't know that we can really talk a whole lot about Lacan's um, uh, analysis of schizophrenia, but uh, from what one understands, which is, in my case, not very much, uh, the, 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 the contributions to a newer understanding of schizophrenia, there's several, the, 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 the one that's sort of dominant in the Anglo-American realm is the notion of schizogenesis, uh, 
uh, Bateson's theory of the double bind and the analysis, the, uh, the Lang's, uh, 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 the Tavistock analysis of the schizogenic family and so forth, that is, these are families uh, so structured that the child's experience is that of the double bind, uh, where the double bind being um, a sign which says, don't read this sign, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's a command that you can't possibly, you're boxed in, you have no alternatives, you can't you can't do it, you can't not do it, and so the mind is sort of stunned by that. And uh, the schizogenic family is one in which um, uh, of all kinds of psychic messages are being, bomb the child is being bombarded with these things, and these are all double bind messages which finally immobilize the, the child. There's a very powerful, although I think very, um, and very cunningly devised kind of propaganda film that the Tavistock group uh, made. It's Ken Loach's Family Life, I don't know if you've ever seen it about, um, which is really a kind of, um, well, it's, it's, it's a, a, a kind of, um, it, it's, it's given as a documentary, which it is not. It's a fiction film, and, uh, um, but it, it's a perfect, uh, illustration of this whole process. When the girl leaves her family, she gets better, she meets people she likes and so on. When she's dragged back into this horrible family, she regresses, uh, falls back into Catatani and so on. So uh, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the picture that comes out of, um, uh, out of, the, uh, out of this, the, um, the Anglo-American tradition and which ultimately has its, um, uh, finds its place in anti-psychiatry in Britain. Uh, the, um, the Deleuze and Guattari have, a, as you are aware, have an interesting criticism of anti-psychiatry, that it's, it is a cutting edge of some kind, but that nonetheless all the old Oedipal and family things are somehow maintained in there under the guise of breaking with a lot of stuff. And so uh, for, uh, for Guattari and Deleuze, um, uh, there, is still a, there is still the Oedipal rewriting going on in the Tavistock School's uh, work, whether they... Whether they uh, whether they know it or not. Now, in Lacan, uh, it, it, the theory of schizophrenia is a little bit different um, and more immediately relevant to what I want to say about these things, although the family business will also have to come to terms with in Lens. Uh, and in Artaud, you notice all the, all the quotes, uh, the attack on the Papa Mama and so on that, they, that Deleuze quotes. I mean, it's clear that Artaud is not only uh, a diagnostician of his own schizophrenia, but also uh, a precursor in this, uh, in this um, understanding of the link between family structure and uh, family recoding and, and schizophrenia. Um, but it, it, Lacan's theory is, uh, uh, is uh, I, I may have said a word about this the other day, uh, that uh, uh, th there is, has been a, a kind of malfunctioning, a failure to accede to what he calls the symbolic order, to the functioning of language. For Lacan, this has to pass through um, his version of the Oedipal stage and of castration, which he says is uh, the name of the father. That's how he transforms the father into linguistics. It's not the father, it's the name of the father, which is, uh, which is the key experience and which is the form taken by castration. Because after all, the individual father is just is just some body smell or whatever that appears in the baby's uh, horizon that has no is not understood in terms of that function. The key Oedipal moment would be the moment at which you understood that that uh, that that uh, unique uh, uh, living uh, presence was also father, law, castration, and all those things. So in that sense, Lacan is right that uh, the Oedipal experience has to be an experience of uh, the role uh, of, that the father plays, a kind of experience of the abstract, ultimately an experience of words, namely the word father, uh, and not just a proper name, which as we've seen in Deleuze is a very different thing because the proper name is part of the flux, you know, proper names just attached to one ingredient in the flux and they don't, uh, they don't uh, represent a an experience of this um, of the symbolic order of this kind of abstract uh, uh, property of language. Well, once that's made, that experience of um, of language in the abstract of the symbolic order for Lacan, then the rest of speaking and speech and all the functions that go with it, the shifter, the experience of the subject, experience of my own personality, negation, all those things, 
come into view. Uh, but the schizophrenic has not gotten that far. And therefore, uh, the schizophrenic uh, suffers from uh, this incomplete access. In the, the schizophrenic doesn't fit into the symbolic order. The, that's why the schizophrenic is constantly in crisis in his or her own um, uh, subject. Now, what happens then to language and to speaking you know, for the schizophrenic is that whereas for the normal, uh, this is all Lacan, I'm, I'm just throwing this out very fast, I don't know how useful it is. Whereas um, for Lacan, normal, lang and normal people, that is to say uh, neurotics uh, rather than psychotics, um, uh, their mode of uh, entry into language uh, is also a mode of, of formation of the unconscious because um, in the normal people uh, there's, there's then the division between conscious and unconscious and so forth and for Lacan that's all tied up with the very nature of language. Uh, this is achieved by something called primal repression uh, as opposed to secondary repression later on, that's all for it. Now for Lacan, this doesn't happen to the schizophrenic. Instead of repression, and this is the concept I was aiming at and I think is important for us. The schizophrenic knows something else which is called forclusion. Uh, instead of uh, a, a repression which then produces conscious categories and language, and Lacan likes to use this semiotic fraction, you know, the bar where uh, the, 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 the real subject is underneath the bar, uh, what's above the bar is the conscious subject, the, the, the word I, uh, the, the, my, my proper name, my function, and so on and so forth. Uh, now this hasn't happened in the schizophrenic. On the contrary, for the schizophrenic, uh, the whole language function has disappeared completely. It's not repressed within his experience, it's vanished and it's gone outside. Outside what? I don't know. That means it comes back in the, form of, uh, in, in the form of a presence which no longer seems to have any connection with the schizophrenic himself. That is, in the form of voices. Uh, the schizophrenic, schizophrenic hallucinations and voices and so forth are this, uh, this, is this linguistic function which has been foreclosed, shut out, and which is then coming back uh, in, a, uh, in, in an apparently autonomous form, which a schizophrenic doesn't recognize. Um, if you like, um, uh, but Watt heard nothing of this because of other voices, singing, crying, stating, murmuring things unintelligible in his ear. With these, if he was not, un if he was not familiar, he was not unfamiliar either, so he's not uh, alarmed unduly. Now these voices, sometimes they sang only, and sometimes they cried only, and sometimes they stated only, and sometimes they murmured only, and sometimes they sang and cried, and sometimes they sang and stated, and sometimes they sang and murmured, and sometimes they cried and stated, and sometimes they cried and murmured, and sometimes they stated and murmured, and so on and so on and so on. Um, uh, all, all together at the same time as now to mention only these four kinds of voices, for there were others, and sometimes Watt understood all, and sometimes he understood much, and sometimes he understood little, and sometimes he understood nothing as now. Well, uh, the voices, and then we pass from that mode of representation to, um, to other kinds of representation, you know, in, in, this, in this work, uh, the, uh, then the, the musical score becomes a kind of uh, another uh, way of way of um, representing that that new kind of uh, the way you record the presence of these foreclosed voices that are coming from the outside. Well, these are all then. Uh, this is then um, the reason why uh, language is both unimportant and crucial in this in this uh, whole uh, business of, of schizophrenia and, and the form that that takes. Okay, that said, I want to look. Um, Let's see, how shall I do this? I think first I'll read you just a few passages of these letters of Vartot, uh, which um, I think are, uh, are, are of great interest for what we're going to see. You understand, um, this is, it's a very, it's a correspondence that's sort of interesting in itself. This is, I think, before, uh, sort of at the beginnings of surrealism. Um, the manifesto is 24, I guess. These are 23, these letters, 23, 24. Uh, Artaud is sending his first poems uh, to the editor, uh, Jacques Rivière, the editor of the NRF, which is at that point uh, 
oh, like Eliot's Criterion a little bit later, um, maybe some of, like some of the other great um, little reviews in the modernist movement, this one a little bit more, maybe um, uh, a little bit more establishment than that. Uh, one of the great organs of, uh, of contemporary modernism, uh, uh, founded by Gide, and which houses then all of the things that are happening, Proust, Claudel, and so on. So uh, Artaud feels uh, uh, that uh, he wants to publish these things in the NF. Rivière sends back a note in which he explains to him, as nicely as he can, it's a kiss-off, that, um, well, they're real, they're, they're, they're powerful uh, aspects to these poems, but they suffer from inequalities. Um, uh, awkward expressions, uh, um, infelicitous uh, diction, and so on and so forth. And this is quite true. This is quite, uh, if you read these things, you know exactly what's meant by that. Uh, Artaud wants desperately to publish these poems. I guess that's also a syndrome that everybody understands. Uh, and he wants to have these things published, wants to have a publication. So he writes and he, and he wants to defend himself and he can't separate himself from these objects, and he, so he writes back to Hivier and try to, tries to defend himself in ways that we'll see. Then this correspondence gets going. Finally, Hivier says, um, well, look, uh, I still don't think much of the poems, but why don't we publish this correspondence? Uh, and uh, in, in which we can include a poem or two as a sample, but uh, this will be a very different thing. And there are a few final letters uh, in which suddenly it's as though they feel a public there and they begin to make larger statements. What's funny, uh, the, uh, Riviere has his anxiety. Uh, uh, there's a whole um, religious crisis in Riviere's work, uh, which, is, uh, which makes him uh, not uninteresting. But it, certainly in this context, Riviere comes across as, uh, as the square and uh, as, as straight and as the, the person who really represents a kind of bourgeois uh, uh, kind of horrible uh, bourgeois uh, heaviness uh, as opposed to the things that Artaud, and it, it's a very interesting and nice kind of contrast. Um, now what Artaud is trying to explain to him, and this is why these are so fundamental, this, this correspondence, you'll find this in almost every, there are several collections selected Artaud in English. This is in the first volume of the collected works in French. Um, uh, there's this old Susan Sontag anthology of Artaud uh, in City Lights Press, which has this, I think, there's all, the, the one you used was not that, but for our Strauss, a newer one, uh, but these, this, this correspondence is very widely available. Okay, this is what Otto says. Um, I suffer, because what he's trying to say is that these poems, uh, Rivière's uh, viewpoint is the, are aesthetic standards and aesthetic values. But these poems are not that, they are somehow uh, uh, records of something. They are uh, traces, they are acts, and therefore none of these values of good and bad uh, have, any, uh, real, um, uh, have any real relevance to any of this anymore. Uh, the question of the acceptability of these poems is a problem which concerns you as much as it does me. I'm speaking, of course, of their absolute acceptability of their literary existence. That is, if this is so, what is the status of this language? I suffer from a horrible sickness of the mind. My thought abandons me at every level, from the simple fact of thought to the external fact of its materialization in words. Words, shapes of sentences, internal directions of thought, simple reactions of the mind. I am in constant pursuit of my intellectual being. So already you have two states. You have what the mind is when it is neither thinking or speaking, right? But that's a horrible kind of void. And that void somehow wants to be filled with thought and then with words. Now, this is something that we don't generally experience because we're always either talking to ourselves or thinking or something. I mean, we don't, how would you, how could you distinguish, uh, how could any of us distinguish between um, the mind, uh, the mind empty and the mind doing all these various things, thinking, perceiving, and so on. Uh, this is not something I think, except maybe at moments when you, 
suddenly can't think of a word, there's a kind of blank. Uh, uh, there are those sort of fitful experiences, which are, I guess, the closest thing that we come to this, but this is apparently uh, a long-lasting kind of experience for, um, for Arto, this absence of thought and of language to the point where you've got to try to find thought or try to find language to, uh, to, to, to fill that with. I am in constant pursuit of my intellectual being. Thus, as soon as I can grasp a form, however imperfect, I pin it down for fear of losing the whole thought. I lower myself, I know, and I suffer from it, but I consent to it for fear of dying altogether. So that these poems, uh, which are imperfect, faulty, flawed, uh, uh, not sufficiently realized, awkward, and so on, they are that way because they're fragments that are seized to try to... Uh, to try to nail down some, some being. Okay. Uh, um, these, the scattered quality of my poems, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm moving through several letters here, must be attributed not to a lack of practice, a lack of control of the instrument I was handling, a lack of intellectual development, but to a central collapse of the soul and to, to a kind of erosion, both essential and fleeting, of the thought, of, of thought of the thought, uh, to a temporary non-possession of the material benefits of my development, to an abnormal separation of the elements of thought, the impulse to think at each of the terminal stratifications of thought passing through all the stages of the bifurcations of thought in the form. There is something which destroys my thought, something which does not prevent me from being what I might be, but which leaves me, so to speak, in suspension, something furtive which robs me of the words that I've found, which reduces my mental tension, which is gradually destroying in its substance the body of my thought, which is even robbing me of the memory of those idioms with which one expresses oneself and which translate accurately the most, uh, accurately the most inseparable, the most localized, the most living inflections of thought. Um, I am perfectly aware of the sudden stops and starts in my poems. They are related to the very essence of inspiration and proceed from my chronic inability to concentrate on an object. Because of a physiological weakness, a weakness which affects the very substance of that which is usually called the soul, or which is the emanation of our nervous force coagulated around objects. But this weakness afflicts our whole age, as witness Tristan Tara, André Breton, Pierre Rivardi. But in their case, the soul is not physiologically damaged. It is not damaged substantially, but it is damaged at all the points where it joins something else. It is not damaged outside of thought. What then is the source of the trouble? Is it really the atmosphere of the age, a miracle floating in the air, a cosmic and evil anomaly, or the discovery of a new world, an actual expansion of reality? The fact nevertheless remains that they, the surrealists, do not suffer and that I do suffer, not only in the mind, but in the flesh, and in my everyday soul. This lack of connection to the object which characterizes all of literature is in me a lack of connection to life. Now, uh, uh, there I think one has a kind of, uh, one is at a point at which modernism and postmodernism separate. That is, uh, Breton, uh, Roverdi, and so forth represent uh, a, a modernist experience. But this is not the experience that Artaud is talking about, or it's not the same stage of that experience. Okay, uh, all of these things you see also then paranoid reunifying impulses in this. Uh, uh, the later Artaud had all kinds of delirium about cosmic conspiracies and so forth and went through all forms of the occult and... Uh, and, and uh, and had all kinds of uh, delirium. That's already clear in this notion that uh, not only is this happening to thought, but somebody is doing it. Uh, now, uh, but, but it seems to me that um, the, 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 the basic uh, use for us of this is in this description of the way in which the mind is abandoned by its functions uh, and left in this kind of, in this kind of isolation. Okay, now I think uh, this will clarify some features of, of Lenz. Um, uh, 
This text, uh, <coughs> as I say, is a very remarkable thing, it seems to me. It's about, uh, uh, it's a kind of historical reconstruction, or re it's a fragment of something like a historical novel about the, um, the Sturm und Drang poet uh, Lenz, who was a contemporary of Goethe and who, uh, whose works, uh, they're best, the one that's best known is the one that Brecht readapted, the, the Hofmeister, the, 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 the tutor. Uh, but uh, whose works then correspond to this um, anti-ancien regime, violently political stage of, of uh, younger German intellectuals in the in the 70s, of which uh, of which Goethe was was a part before he became something else. I don't know whether early Schiller is counted as part of Sturm und Drang, but the robbers, I guess, would be another example of that of that mood. Uh, Lenz, like Hildelin later on and so on, um, after writing these two or three important plays, then um, sank into madness and I think must have died uh, fairly young, I'm not sure about the rest of his career. But in this sense, I suppose these, uh, this, um, I don't know where Buchner got these, these details, but I suppose that in some general way this is historically accurate. And uh, meanwhile, his reflections, I don't know about the aesthetic reflections where he's talking about um, his interest in some, some kind of realism as opposed to uh, what he calls idealism. I suspect there's a kind of contamination there with a kind of later uh, notion. Well, he's talking, he's attacking what became uh, in the German tradition what's called classicism or, or for us neoclassicism. That is the idea that precisely the, the Apollo Belvedere or the Sistine Madonna or whatever are the, uh, uh, are the, the models for um, uh, or, or Winkelmann's idea of Greek art are the models for uh, the kind of literature that should be produced. So you get then the, the, the classical period of both Goethe and, and Schiller. Well, that's what's being um, attacked in, these, uh, uh, in, the, in the aesthetic discussion here. Uh, but it seems to me that also this has very close, this is sort of mixed up with um, German Romanticism too. Uh, Büchner is writing after all at what, uh, this is the 30s, uh, some um, 50 or 60 years difference. And I think uh, this picture of Lenz and the Sturm und Hang collapses the Sturm und Hang into the Romantic period in ways that we'll look at uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, now, uh, Büchner himself, um, the, the work that's, um, he wrote th only three plays, this, uh, his medical thesis, and then uh, finally a, a political pamphlet uh, an anti um, an anti uh, restoration pamphlet which uh, ha which got him condemned by the state of Hesse and pursued by the police and so forth and uh, uh, Brichner was uh, is I think a a very uh, very kind of passionate example of uh, this um, uh, pre eighteen forty eight radicalism in um, in uh, um, uh, in Germany, and it's a kind of radicalism which it seems to me is very actual, or at least uh, almost a 60s radicalism, which combines uh, both real, uh, real uh, political intransigence, but also then this fascination for aberrant states, schizophrenic states, and so on. The other work of his that, of course, is a real, uh, uh, is a real, uh, uh, and a kind of materialism in, in the sense of his, then his, uh, his, uh, his medical work, and uh, uh, which is cut off when he he gets the uh, typhus, I guess, or but uh, dies in the, in the in the middle of these medical studies at that early age, I think thirty two or three. Um, but uh, uh, this um, uh, I've lost my own train of thought here. I just interrupted myself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the other work of his that is known in uh, uh, in our corner of the world is uh, the play Wozzeck, which uh, Alban Berg uh, made into an opera, and which is certainly also uh, a, uh, a dramatization of these, uh, of all of these uh, aberrant states, since Wozzeck can be considered, uh, is, is certainly a schizophrenic, but at that point uh, in the play, we have uh, a whole um, social and political content of Wozzeck too, because not only is he the schizophrenic, he is the, uh, the, the underclass and the, uh, the servant, the, uh, the excluded, and, and all the rest of it. So uh, 
and I think in a genuine Deleuzean way, there is no real choice between those two things. That is, uh, this is uh, uh, Wojcik's schizophrenia is as much a political and social uh, phenomenon as it is a clinical phenomenon, and really we're at a point where the psychological and the political aren't aren't separated anymore. Uh, well, Dan Danton's death is another uh, is another well known play, but that's that's uh, has a somewhat different focus. Um, okay, I say these things um, because it seems to me that um, there are some multiple perspectives here. That is, this does say something about, and we would have to say something about romanticism and the experience of romanticism, the relationship of this kind of uh, uh, of this kind of uh, experience to romanticism. Uh, but on the other hand, we're looking back at this from a from a later, more politicized position, which is also closely related to to our own time. Uh, I think the um, the place you can sense these, this the most, and surely Brüchner is a powerful influence on these people, whether they, whether they say so or not, you can find it the most in the newer German movies, in particular the movies of Werner Herzog, if you know A Heart of Glass. Uh, and I assume uh, his movie on Kaspar Hauser, did he do that too? Which is uh, this discovery of this autistic uh, uh, individual wandering around Europe who became sort of legendary. It's, uh, these are similar. Uh, similar experiences of um, of that of the aberrant uh, mental state in Heart of Glass. You have this odd kind of rural rural countryside, which is strewn with with people who are uh, somehow completely um, aberrant psychically. People who have visions. People who are in sort of catatonic uh, states. Uh, people who t are talking themselves and so wandering around. I understand that the whole who was telling me that that. Uh, Indeed, the actors were hypnotized before the before the movie was made, which accounts for their sort of their glassy kind of uh, um, uh, uh, movements and and so forth. But I think that can give you um, a sense of um, of a very intense feeling of this whole uh, thing, uh, which rewrites. Uh, the standard histories of German literature, German culture, German romanticism, and so on. I think, in a somewhat different way, by introducing a whole other uh, set of ingredients uh, uh, alongside it. Uh, now, uh, I think the most important, um, the most important feature of all this is landscape, and that's why I want to uh, associate this with um, with romanticism in general, with those movies uh, and. Uh, and, and look at that. Um, look at that as a kind of historical phenomenon. Now, before I do that, I want to read a passage here, which I think really pulls almost everything together. Um, uh, if anyone has these, this text, uh, it's page 162. And which gives us the most complete description of Lenz's state uh, in a way uh, which allows us to uh, um, articulate the various ingredients, so to speak. Meanwhile, his condition grew more and more dis disconsolate. All the tranquility that he had derived from Oberlin's presence, Oberlin is the pastor with whom he's living in the mountains. And by the way, it seems to me that there's something very, um, there is a kind of, harmony between the mountain landscape and life in a kind of mountainous area like uh, Switzerland or whatever in uh, or, or, the, or this part of what would it be I don't know. Uh, and uh, I think this is Switzerland and uh, and, um, and 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 these experiences as though somehow this is also the case in gargoyles in this uh, Thomas Bernhardt book which is about contemporary Austria but which also has this Mountain landscape, in which is characterized by jumble, by uh, by unpredictability, by disorganization, by emergence of one thing and then another, and so on. There seems to be some some kind of intimate relationship to that uh, to that landscape and the kind of experience one has walking in it and living in it, uh, and also behind that, naturally, um, the whole relationship of uh, of of this experience to the rural slum, which it seems to me is crucial both here and in Beckett. Uh, but uh, but in that case, you have uh, a rural slum which is somehow reinforced by the difficulties of the terrain itself, so to speak. That is, it's not, as in the case of Ireland, a colonial product and, a, and, a, and, a, and an underdevelopment uh, and, a, uh, and a result of, um, of uh, 
political and economic dependency, but it's a result of uh, the very um, isolation of these villages in, in the landscape and, uh, and their decay and the, everybody leaving them and, and all the rest of it. So it seems to me that the whole, uh, this, uh, uh, this functions then on two levels. It functions on a level of earth and the way, uh, and the way it's, the way we experience it and the way then we, ch we try to recode it, so to speak. And uh, on a social, uh, from a social point of view, uh, on the level of the, 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 the kind of um, social blockage or immobilization or paralysis, which is associated with this particular landscape. That is, it, it doesn't seem to me that um, uh, one can imagine mental illness in, uh, in precisely in these mountainous districts. Uh, one doesn't associate it necessarily with cornfields or anything. I mean, there's a very different kind of, or one doesn't, it doesn't, express itself in that way, the way it does here. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. I, that sounds sort of mystical, but I think you'll see a little more what I mean by it when I, when I, uh, when I read a few of these things. Meanwhile, let, let me though finish this, uh, this kind of key passage. All the tranquility that he had derived from Oberlin's presence and from the quietness of the valley had left him. The world he had once hoped to serve was severed by a monstrous gap. He had neither hatred nor love, nor hope, only a dreadful void in himself and a tremendous restlessness to fill it. Well, here then is what Otto is talking about. This void uh, is precisely this unpeopled state of the mind which, whose thoughts have been stolen from, from, from it, whose language has been stolen from it, but which is intolerable as such, which has to be filled, hence this restlessness. Um, he had nothing. What he did, he did with no consciousness, and yet he was driven by an inner impulse. Something is there. It sends him out. Remember the, the, the scene in which at night, when suddenly in the dark, uh, he can't stand it, he, he races down the stairs, he cuts himself on the rocks, he throws himself into the fountain. Um, something is making him do that, yet that something is not inside of his mind, because if it were inside of his mind, that would be him then, it would be something he wants to do. This is not, in other words, uh, the kind of drivenness or possession which is that of, um, uh, of, of people who have, of obsessives, let's say, where uh, the psyche identifies itself with its obsession. It thinks that that obsession is precisely what it wants, and so it's not that kind of drivenness at all. Uh, it's the drivenness to do something with this, with this void. Now, late, almost immediately after that, this void will be characterized, very in interesting, as boredom. Uh, and I think Brishna is one of the first places where this almost immediately major theme of the 19th century comes into being, because uh, I think that uh, the romantics aren't bored in that sense, uh, and boredom suddenly is born fully grown in, uh, in Baudelaire and in the in, the, in, in Flaubert in the, in, in the 50s. Uh, so boredom is a new word for this, uh, for this uh, thing, and which one which is also will become a means of control and, uh, and a means of doing something to it again. Uh, but uh, right now we're seeing it in its, un, uh, in its unmanaged state, so to speak, as precisely this loss of everything that Otto described for us. When alone, he was so dreadfully lonely that he constantly spoke out loud with himself, called out, there is no voice inside the mind. So you have to have a voice outside of it, your own, something else, visions, whatever. Uh, it can only come to you from, from the outside. Um, called out, then grew startled, as though a strange voice had spoken with him. Well, this is precisely Foucaultio. Uh, the voice has been sent out, and then a minute later you forgot that you said that, and you, as you remember it, it's somebody else speaking. You see the process that is, it's, uh, uh, it's one that uh, uh, where um, the, uh, the objectification of the voice essentially comes from the breakdown of continuity between instants. Uh, so, and people have, you know, in, in a fever you can have this experience of drugs or whatever where uh, you, 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 you have, you, you start a, a, a project which is a sentence uh, halfway through it, you forget you said it, and then, but it's still there. You remember it, but not having said it, and so it comes to you as though it were someone else. Um, 
He often stammered in conversation, an indescribable fear came over him that he'd forgot me in a sense, well, this is precisely what we're talking about. Then he thought that he must hold fast to the last word spoken and continue speaking. He suppressed this desire only with intense effort. Well, uh, this then is the, uh, dramatizes the beginnings uh, of all of these, um, of all of these uh, um, uh, features. That is, we have this initial void in which language and thought are gone, uh, this horrible fear, restlessness, whatever you want to call it, which has to be, uh, which is, uh, which drives uh, this, the subject to, to, to fill this void again somehow, and it's at night, so there aren't any objects either, you see. Um, now, uh, how does this, um, how does this get, uh, and, and this is then all connected with language, how does this get uh, handled? In this text, there are sort of three ways. First of all, um, well, the three versions of it. His friends come to see him. They start to talk about art, culture, uh, you know, writing, and so forth. Now he's back in his old, old world. Uh, he talks with great uh, abandon and so on. He feels good. Uh, Bruchner says, um, for a while, um, he had completely forgotten himself. Well, that's one way that one gets out of this. That is, he's thinking about what he's thinking rather than about himself, and, and he's in an, an older, more familiar world in which uh, he's an acting subject, doing things, uh, uh, having literary projects, and so on and so forth. Another way was through the sermon. Uh, and this is then an experience of suffering which ends up uh, being an experience of self-pity. I won't read this section, but it seems to me what's, what's been able to happen here uh, is that uh, he has been able to feel in the sense of suffering. He says, I, uh, um, well, maybe I will have to read it. Um, For him, the universe was an open wound. It caused him deep, inex inexplicable pain. But that's good. You remember that in uh, Deleuze's description of the intensities, it doesn't matter what the intensity is, if it's an intensity, it can generate an experience of the subject. So um, a form of ecstasy, a form of exaltation, a form of violent depression, a form of suffering, all of those things are good. All of those things are stimulating. All of those things are intensity, and the subject is regenerated. So this feeling of suffering must be completely separated from uh, the other uh, description of the void. The point about the void is you, can't fe you don't feel anything. He can't feel anything. Uh, and that's the problem. He can't think anything, he can't say anything, he can't feel anything. There isn't anything there, and he isn't there. Uh, whereas when you can feel suffering, and then you speak to these apparently suffering people about their own suffering, the sufferings of life, uh, and then what's generated is um, uh, dur uh, uh, during the singing, his numbness had completely disappeared. Numbness is another word for this void. Uh, he sensed a quiet, deep pity for himself. Well, now he's back in the world of, um, of subjects again. Uh, then self-pity then uh, confirms your existence as a person or as a personality or as an individuality or psyche. So that's a way of getting out of this. But that doesn't last either. Uh, finally, there is, our, or, or really initially, uh, this form of peacefulness. Uh, and this comes to him in the pastor's house and is associated clearly with the, with the, um, uh, with the, with the person of the pastor uh, because, uh, for several reasons. First of all, the pastor makes it clear that, well, not that he's had these experiences exactly, but the, some of the pastor's thing, uh, remarks to him are ones that he understands. Uh, the pastor tells him that once in the mountains, he had been thrown into a sort of trance as a result of looking into a deep, empty mountain pool. Well, this is very analogous to Lenz's own experiences. So that kind of thing uh, helps in this process of um, endowing the pastor with a, with a kind of force, a calming kind of force. Now, this is the point at which we, have, we run at once into the deleuze Guattari problem of Oedipal interpretation. Because it's clear from, from that point of view that the pastor becomes a father figure for him and all the rest of it. Now, the, the real crisis here comes not only when the pastor takes a trip, rejection and so forth, uh, but when he comes back from this trip, 
urging Lenz to go back to his father. Lenz has had a message from his father saying, look, why don't you be a businessman like me? When are you going to come, out of, come, come back out of the mountains and do something and so on and so on? He gets violently uh, disturbed and so forth, and obviously this is the, the schizogenic uh, family again. Uh, when the pastor comes back, uh, making himself the vehicle and the vessel of these, uh, this command of the father, suddenly he's no good anymore as a substitute father. Uh, and at that point, we have another father appear, who is the shaman, the medicine man. Uh, this is a figure that you find in this Werner Herzog film, too. The idea that in, in some of these villages or outside them or something, people live there who, have, who are known for their faith healers. Or they're known for their, uh, this guy is a dowser, uh, he has visions, uh, he, uh, he has a whole set of magical properties. So suddenly, outside of this, uh, but Lenz is afraid of him. So now, the repository of magical, mystical power is no longer the, the Christian pastor, but, uh, but this kind of pagan uh, faith healer of whom Lenz is, um, uh, is afraid. And at that point, from that point on, everything goes to pieces and this sort of fragile synthesis disappears. Now, it's clear that this is also a rewriting of this tranquilizing uh, effect that the pastor is able to have on him for a while. Uh, this is a rewriting, recoding in religious terms, and this is something we have to discuss in, in, when we come to Beckett, too. Um, uh, the point about the religious terminology is here, the reason it can function here, uh, is that it's all in terms of language, the voice and the vision. You note that the two paintings that he, that he says something about, Lentz, when he's talking art, uh, are uh, Rembrandt's Christ of Emmaus, Um, page 151. One of them is that of Christ and the disciples from Emmaus. I don't recall a painter. When one reads in the New Testament how the disciples went out, one finds, finds all of nature in those few words, landscape. Um, it is a gloomy evening at twilight, a monotonous line of crimson on the horizon, the road half dark. Suddenly a stranger comes towards them. They talk. He breaks bread with them. Then they recognize him in simple human form. Uh, the divine suffering face reveals itself to them and they're afraid and so on and so on. Uh, so you have the fear of landscape, uh, dusk, strange lights in the sky, transformation of objects, uh, difficulties in perception. And these things are banished by the speaking word and by the message. So this is a way in which this language that's been shut out or foreclosed is able to come back in in a in a calming, domesticated form. Uh, and indeed, we're going to see that in Beckett also, this foreclosed language tends to take the form of characters and, uh, and to be then reinserted in, in the work in, in terms of characters. Now, it's interesting then that the other painting, and I assume this is uh, Vermeer, huh? the woman, the, the, the reading woman, um, is, also, is also an experience of language. Um, then there's another painting, a woman sitting in her chamber with her prayer book in her hand, reading the text. Uh, the source of uh, not truth but language. Um, the house has been cleaned in preparation for Sunday, sand strewn on the floor, comfortably clean and warm. Another phenomenology of space, another experience of landscape, another kind of domestic experience which moves from this frightening experience of landscape and Rembrandt to the notion of the dwelling, the house, the female figure, and so on. So that uh, so the both of these paintings, this this juxtaposition of these two paintings, are in a way um, uh, precisely the the, the 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 trajectory of something like a cure uh, for Lenz. Now, uh, okay, finally, I want to um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about landscape itself because it seems to me that it's very um, uh, that it's uh, um, that is sort of crucial here. As it seems to me that this whole notion of Stimmung, uh, Deleuze and Klosowski associate this with Nietzsche. Now, certainly Nietzsche is filled with Stimmung, uh, that is mood, intensity, sudden feelings of things. I'm not sure myself uh, where, whether Nietzsche talks about this directly, and if anybody knows, I'd be interested in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in finding out. Uh, as far as I know, the theoretician of Stimmung is rather Heidegger, who says, who tells us in Being in Time, that um, Stimmung is really the fundamental form 
that we live our being in the world. That is, um, uh, the, the, um, the experience of worldness in its most immediate concrete form is this sense that, um, uh, that uh, the world is filled with affect, that, uh, that um, uh, there is no Stimmung, the opposite of Stimmung would be an indifference to space, a feeling that this doesn't speak to us. Stimmung is the outside world speaking to us in some way. So, in a Bachelardian way, if you like. So, suddenly, um, you have a sense that, uh, that the landscape is cozy and warm, that it's large and forbidding, uh, that a room is filthy and sort of revolting, uh, or on the contrary, that it's, uh, uh, that it's very rich and plush or something like that. There are millions of forms that this can take, but, uh, but it has to take the form of a kind of, um, a, a kind of relationship of intensity of, the outside, of, of this particular disposition of objects, which you feel to be the outside world, to the, to the psyche. Uh, now, um, let, me, let me quickly give some examples of this. The, the very opening of the lens is this experience of fog in the mountains, wet fog. It was cold and damp. The water trickled down the rocks and leapt across the road. The branches of firs hung down heavily in the damp air. Gray clouds drifted across the sky, but quite close together. And then the mist rose up and swept heavily and damply through the foliage, languidly, awkwardly. So all of this is a, is a unified landscape that speaks a single thing. Now, it seems to me that this is precisely, uh, and finally Lentz says, everything was so small to him, so close, so damp, he'd, he'd have liked to set the earth behind the stove to dry. So this whole... The landscape is speaking. The landscape is a voice, is a language. Uh, it has a message. Uh, or finally, the breakdown of nature uh, into its elements. Um, the, the, the deep, empty mountain pool I read you about. He said that the simplest, purest people were those who were near the elemental. The more refined a man's feelings in life, the more blunted this elemental sense becomes. <coughs> he thought that it must be a feeling of endless bliss to be in such close contact with the particular life of every form. They have a soul for rocks, metals, water, and plants. To take into himself, as in a dream, every element of nature, like flowers that breathe with the waxing and waning of the moon. Well, uh, obviously that's very close to, to experiences in, in English Romanticism, to Wordsworth, uh, the whole um, uh, uh, fascination of Wordsworth with, with states of the mind that are reduced Wordsworth's imbeciles to the to the most sort of simplest and, and elemental form of of, uh, of thinking, which is then the closest to um, to the experience of the of the insensate rocks and and, and so forth. Um, this is also, uh, it seems to me, uh, a uh, an indication of how the landscape is going to break down, and this will happen in Beckett, uh, but but in other people too. That is, um, you have this Stimmung that unifies the landscape, but then the landscape itself is going to break down. It's just a jumble of objects. So you have, you have trees, you have stones, rocks, all those things are side by side. What do you do with all those things? So they're all, each one is separate from each other, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, you have a kind of experience of each of these things by itself. But that's a very paradoxical thing, as we'll see when we get to back. OK, now, I, I think what I'd like to say about this um, or this is the framework that one would want to look at this in, and, and I don't know whether we could do any more than, than that. <coughs> As I understand it, landscape has been uh, a begriff, has been a, a real meaningful concept for societies, really at only two, two moments in, in human history, that is in tribal society um, this is the experience of the body of the earth that Deleuze talks about. Uh, in nomadic society, obviously the very outer limit of everything you do is nature and is the configuration of the landscape and so on. Uh, and, in, and in modern times. Uh, in, the, in the classical period, if there's any landscape, it's just a theater. So think of a Poussin painting, you know, where there's certainly 
hierarchically organized landscape, but all of that is there uh, so that you can place your human figures in the middle of it like a theater. Uh, and I think that in, uh, in, uh, in classical times, uh, uh, if I understand right, the, the moments of uh, the intrusion of landscape as an autonomous thing, you understand, that has its own kind of meaning, uh, are sort of breakdown products, parts of romance and so on, but that essentially um, landscape is always background, decor, uh, and so on and so on until, until modern times. Now, um, but obviously with romanticism, landscape becomes uh, a, a thing in its own right, something that has an autonomous intelligibility. That is, uh, for, the, for the Ancien Regime, for, uh, for societies uh, of that kind, um, the model is not the landscape but the city. What's centered is the whole, uh, the, the, the tracing out of the city uh, according to the cardinal points, the center of all this in the forbidden palace or the center of the, uh, the, the, the place of the despot, the place of the body of the despot, as Deleuze would say, and that's not landscape in our sense. So that for them, uh, for them, uh, the idea of looking at uh, something with no human figures in it uh, is not an intelligible activity any more than for earlier generations it would have been an intelligible activity to look at a bunch of uh, splotches on a canvas that don't represent anything. So we have to ask ourselves how it is that this, uh, that this particular uh, um, bit of uh, re external reality is able to become autonomized. Uh, and we have to also try to come to a sense of, uh, of the, the terrific gap between this contemporary experience of landscape that we find here, uh, or romantic contemporary, that's 19th and 20th century experience of landscape, and the whole experience uh, in, in primitive society, which is obviously completely different and has no connections with that. That is, their uh, landscape is dominant because uh, the, uh, the, the pygmies worship nature as an, as an external force and the forest and so on because the forest is the very, uh, the very framework on which, their whole, on which their lives depend. Here it would seem that the experience of landscape is at least partly a, a breakdown experience. That is to say, it is a, uh, it's part of um, um, the, uh, uh, the breakdown of uh, a unified, form, unified forms of life and thereby of the unification of the outside world. So suddenly uh, the outside world breaks into separate pieces which can then become autonomized. And so now one can look at this piece which then in certain forms of romanticism uh, serves to, um, serves to uh, f figure a kind of opposition to the city. I think that's clear in, in, uh, in, in English romanticism. I don't know, in, in German Romanticism, the, 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 the places that you find this where it's sort of fascinating, uh, in, um, in the painters, in Hunger, for example, where this idea that really landscape is language and there's a kind of, there's, there's, there's an intelligibility there which is just sort of on the tip of your tongue. You can't quite get to it because it never becomes transparent and yet all of those configurations are all so many languages uh, uh, that, that nature is speaking to you and you have to try to uh, record in some way that, uh, that, that, that message, that, that intelligibility that's just out of reach. Well, uh, so again, of course, uh, this is part of this, uh, of, a, of a kind of language crisis. Now, uh, where this is, I think, um, uh, most powerfully um, uh, expressed um, in, a, in a kind of non, uh, in a kind of non um, pathological way is in things like um, uh, the greatest of all romantic paintings, of the, the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich that, that, that you probably know, where you have landscape, that is you have the northern German landscape, the plains, the water, the, the ship, rocks or mountains or whatever, but the whole point of this a fascinating landscape, which are generally dusk or dawn and so forth. The whole center of gravity is not the landscape, but the backs of a group of people looking at the landscape. So the center of the painting is not the language of nature, which you can't really realize, but people reading the language of nature. Uh, so the whole uh, center of gravity of the painting is, this, uh, is reading itself is trying to hear this message, hear this voice, uh, 
surprise this intelligibility of landscape, which is, however, for us, the viewer, infinitely mysterious and always out of reach because we're not, we're always mediated by the people who are there looking at it. And they're always this little group of people who are, who are seeing, you know, seeing this in the distance. Um, now, that's why I would say that the whole revival of the schizophrenic and this lens fragment, for example, and the kind of rewriting of, of German pre-Gründerzeit pre, um, pre German history and so on by people like Werner Herzog uh, is very important because they're, uh, insist they're trying to, to, to break up and estrange the whole um, received idea about romanticism and landscape. I mean, for us, uh, that's, uh, that's a kind of banal and, and almost uh, and, and, and a banal kind of thing which has been completely domesticated by, by establishment culture. So, I mean, naturally, people like to go out and look at pretty scenery and so on. I mean, that's the romantics discovered that. That was very nice, and that's their function and so on. Uh, uh, and to try to estrange that whole view of the relationship of romantics and landscape and show that indeed this relationship is pathological and that, uh, and that it is a schizophrenic relation. When it's most authentic and powerful, it's a schizophrenic relationship to landscape and it's not something which is art appreciation or beautiful scenery or, 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 or the rest of it. Uh, and I think uh, one can profitably reread Wordsworth in that, in that light and, and it becomes uh, very close to what we're to what we're talking about, uh, as long as you remove the attempt then to recontain all this stuff, because obviously with an experience like that, you then try to rewrite it back into more, um, more uh, less dangerous and subversive, um, uh, subversive categories. Okay, uh, I think that's what I wanted to um, wanted to say to you about um, about this lens um, uh, fragment, which I think is is of is of great interest and, and will um, the fragment right, what I was saying uh, and which uh, I think is very useful for us to look at Beckett um, in terms of now I want to do that um, in a um, in, in I want to follow this pattern of the Otto letters uh, in talking about Beckett that that um, uh, that we just uh, saw um, I think there are uh, there obviously has been a lot of very useful and interesting work done on Beckett, uh, an analysis of Beckett from within in his own terms and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't want to repeat that. I don't think that's necessary. Um, but I want to try to see if it's possible uh, to, after having made that description of things, to evaluate Beckett's work in some, in some historical way. That is to say, uh, to in a way, to pull ourselves out of our moment of culture in which Beckett is an accredited pillar of this culture, whatever it is, and to estrange uh, what Beckett has come to mean in, uh, in, in the consumer society culture, postmodernist culture, uh, and to sort of see that in, a, uh, uh, in uh, terms that are radically different from, from the ones we tend to have. Um, I, I, I can do it, I guess, uh, one way I'd like to do it is by uh, giving you my, um, my uh, own personal uh, uh, um, relationship with, with Beckett's work, which I think is, uh, which um, has some kind of emblematic meaning for me. I first found out about Beckett, this was before, um, it was really waiting for Godot that, that launched Beckett as a, as a name in, in, uh, in, in, on the intellectual scene, and it was followed almost immediately by uh, Malloy. Then these things were translated into English, uh, and then uh, Beckett began to become the, the figure uh, that, that he is now. And, and at a certain point then, of course, as Valéry said, uh, all that was left was the Académie Française, or in his, um, in his case, the, the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and Beckett becomes then this kind of monument. But uh, I, I think it's much more interesting to look at um, the way this began. Uh, I read the name of Beckett for the first time in a book of uh, essays about Joyce, in which someone said, uh, look, there, there are some other interesting Irish novels uh, besides Joyce. Uh, and they listed uh, a few weird uh, Irish novels that no one had ever heard of at the time. Uh, there's another one which is, of, of, uh, which is a marvelous novel that some of you, which is now much better known than it was then too, by um, Flann O'Brien called That Swim Two Birds. I don't know if you know that novel. It's in Penguin. I recommend it very highly. Um, 
And uh, the Beckett uh, book that was mentioned was Murphy. Uh, and this, the woman who wrote this article gave a kind of um, account of Murphy and talked about the style and so on and so forth. Now, if you read Murphy then, before the Beckett that we know, uh, what you, the sense that you have, and this is also the sense you have in Watt, and that's why I felt it, is, it was essential that you uh, have an experience of Watt, even if it's only a few pages, um, it's the sense of uh, what Rivière is approaching, uh, reproaching Artaud with. That is, um, this is, um, uh, these are works that have, that are the products of, um, uh, of uh, clearly great intelligence and um, stylistic capacities and so on, but that don't gel. Uh, Beckett comes, uh, these early things of Beckett come at a point where uh, he wants to do a modernism, but it doesn't work. Uh, and uh, I think that one can't, for example, I don't know if you've read this blurb on this, I don't know if this is the edition that you have, but um, we have things like this. He writes with a rhetoric, this is Stephen Spender, he writes with a rhetoric and music that make a poet green with envy. Uh, the, sk the style is amazing, and if writing, pure writing can hold you, this book will. There is not a word, a phrase, a sentence in this narrative that is not crystal clear and in the simplest of English or Irish idioms. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I, Beckett doesn't read like that for me. I mean, the Beckett style, it seems to me, would be the last thing that one would think of praising, let alone its clarity, limpidity, beauty, and all the rest of it. On the contrary, it seems to me that... Uh, the, the, the proper experience one is to have uh, of Beckett is one of, um, uh, well, it's sort of beyond ugliness, too. It's a, it's a kind of heterogeneity and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and things that are sort of pasted together and put together and a kind of real inarticulacy in the style, uh, which is, I think, uh, not at all, in fact, like Artaud's early poems, but which is a phenomenon which is, uh, which is related to those. So I want to say that uh, it seems to me that the historical in interest and originality of, and importance of Beckett is that he comes at a moment when uh, everybody's, uh, everyone is programmed to write great modern literature. This is coming after Joyce and so forth. That means you invent a world, you invent a style, a set of symbols, you write the book of the world and, and all the rest of it. And he can't do it. Uh, it, that is to say, not because of his own incapacities, not because of his own lack of uh, talent. That's what ultimately divides Riviere and Artaud. Artaud is saying, this business of talent and so on has nothing, is not meaningful anymore. It's not a question of my lack of means and so forth. It's something objective that's happening to me and which I'm recording. So, in the same way, I want to say that uh, I think it's interesting to look at Beckett's work, at least in these terms, that uh, the, 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 the badness, the, the, the imperfection of all these early works, their impossibility to really gel into standard successful modernism, the creation of the private world, of the private language, the creation of the private symbols and so on, uh, is an objective, um, is part of the objective situation. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, and Beckett's historical importance is that he experiences the impossibility of modernism and then does something else, which is then partially recoded back into modernist forms, as we'll see, but which remains something else and which then comes to, to be felt as the expression of something very different, which is postmodernism, or which are the requirements of a very different kind of society than, uh, than these. So it seems to me that it's important uh, not to... Um, uh, it's important to make a, to, to, to invent a way of reading these things, which is quite different from the way we read the modern works. I'm I'm assuming that we understand modernism as being kind of successful symbolism of one kind or another. Uh, that is a kind of uh, the invention of um, of a whole thematics, uh, uh, of a whole uh, sign system, uh, which is um, which is coherent. Uh, and which you can train people to learn uh, and to read. So uh, over a number of books, these sign systems, these symbols are worked out. The writer may think it's his ideas, you know, but that's not 
the important thing. Uh, little by little, you develop something which is a kind of coherent <laughs> world, and then that's the world of Lawrence. Uh, Lewis, you see, also is not quite is sort of on the edge of this because he has a science system, but it's uh, it, it has not really gelled uh, uh, the, the way it's gelled in the writers that we think of as canonical for us. T.S. Eliot, say. Uh, uh, the, this is the elaboration of, of, a, of a set of private uh, symbols which take on a kind of coherence, which are organized, I think, around an ethical axis of good and bad and so forth, but that's another question, uh, and which come to have a kind of unity or imminence. Uh, now, what's happening uh, here is that uh, there's the feeling that you ought to do that, but the absolute lack of conviction in it. Uh, so in Beckett, in these early things like what, you can, you can sense uh, a kind of um, half-hearted attempts to, um, to work up a symbol, uh, and then a kind of visceral conviction, this is part of the, 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 the objective situation really, that there's no point to that. The symbol, the symbol can never carry any meaning and, and, uh, uh, and, and there's no point even going on with those things or, or, uh, or as uh, in the character in my favorite book of Beckett's Malone dies, uh, keeps saying, you know, uh, he, he's trying to tell a story, he says, Oh, I'm, I've had enough of this. I can't go on. I can't go. On. It's just too boring and dreary. And, uh, and then the next paragraph goes on, and so on and so forth. Well, I think that's the experience, the breakdown of the possibility of symbols, the breakdown of the possibility of modernism that's being made um, in Beckett. So in Beckett, uh, what's happening is, on the contrary, uh, uh, not that not an experience of um, sort of uh, a recoded meaning. For, uh, for a set of symbols, but rather an experience of precisely their, uh, their distance from meaning. Uh, that is, here are so many objects, but they don't have a meaning. All you can do is count them up. They are, therefore, not really objects, but I'm going to call them items, because in Beckett, it seems to me, that's, that's all they ever amount to, is the landscape is not a, an amalgam of, of objects or natural objects or anything else. It's just a jumble of items that are additively um, experienced. And of course, one of these items is, is the human being itself, the subject, uh, language, and, and all the rest of it. So there's, there are reified experiences of all of these, uh, of all of these various things. Now, um, uh, these, uh, this experience of, um, of items, now, uh, well, let, let me just finish with this because I want to sort of make a preview of what we want to say maybe about Malloy. Um, there is then constantly the, the attempt, and later Beckett will t take this into account, I think Malloy as opposed to Watt is a kind of sign of this, there has to be constantly attempt then to recode all of those, that meaningless heap of things which, which we find in Watt. And uh, for this a number of things uh, suggest themselves, but mainly um, religion. Uh, the whole religious uh, code, which is uh, omnipresent, clearly in Beckett. Now, it, it seems to me that we can't, however, read these things as religious works. Uh, what we have to do is read them um, uh, as works which use, um, uh, which would like to have been religious works, you know, which use the whole religious apparatus, the religious code, as a way of pulling back together a, a number of things. But the code remains dead. Uh, I think the best place to, to see this is maybe not in these novels, but in uh, in Waiting for Godot. If you read it carefully, you see every so often there's a kind of eruption of odd, irrelevant codes. Suddenly, uh, Estragon starts to talk about the two thieves. Well, but that's not that isn't an interpretation of the play. That's just a fragment that, that floats into things and then disappears again, a a along with a lot of other fragments. What's interesting in Beckett is there's a whole uh, completely uh, archaic uh, cultural level of, of poetry from the from the uh, their, their quotes from 1910 poets and and forgotten symbolists and things that sort of sort of drift through these the the, the characters' minds and they, they 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 say something and then they realize this is high style this is poetry or something then they forget about it again uh, religion is like that in waiting for Godot it's nothing but these fragments that that float across float through the through the play um, as though 
they ought to be able to give some kind of unifying armature to the play, but there's no, they're just broken bits and pieces anymore, and they can't do it. So they're there. If you want to do it, that's your problem. And then, of course, you come along and then you make a religious analysis of, of, uh, of waiting for Godot. But then, uh, but then you've, uh, uh, you've done interpretation in the bad sense. That is, you've taken something which really is about the lack of meaning and you've given it a meaning. So, in a sense, you've, uh, you've, you haven't been able to stand that, that experience of fragments and you've had to recode it, recontain it in... in um, in some other way. Now, the other place that it would be interesting to, 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 to make a, a connection with, uh, with, these, uh, with these, this religious code would be in, in, in Flaubert's whole um, notion of commonplaces and cliches and your and so on. Because it seems to me that these bits and pieces of possible interpretive frameworks are that now. Uh, and uh, there isn't... Um, uh, there isn't religion in, in these things, but uh, religion is part of the, the broken flotsam and jetsam of the landscape. So every so Moran will suddenly make up a whole kind of that weird catechism of all these uh, peculiar kinds of um, uh, miracles and so on, and questions about uh, theological questions. But none of that is of any kind of, none of that is operative. It's all in a kind of inert state. Now, in Flaubert, these, um, these bits and pieces are still cultural stereotypes. And it seems to me one would want to say that somehow one can still believe in these things in Flaubert. That is, there are people, uh, the hollow people in Flaubert are people who uh, are nothing, who are lived by these stereotypes, like Monsieur Homme. Um, even Emma, in a sense, well, Emma tries to live these things, but, but understand she can't. Whereas for Monsieur Homais, you can live completely in the cliché, in the world of clichés, that can organize things and so on. Um, it seems to me that uh, in, um, but, the, but there, there's very little religious content to these clichés in Flaubert. These are rather, in Flaubert, the whole clichés of romanticism. All of the dreams of the, 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 the lies, as somebody else will say, uh, as, uh, well, that you get in, in the, whole, the, the whole reaction against romanticism, the notion of the romantic lie in, in, in Ibsen, for example, or in, in this whole set of Polish writings on this and, and other places, where what's denounced are the, the optical illusions, the mirages that the romantics build up and fed people and so forth. It seems to me that that's what's being, uh, those are the, 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 the cliches that, that Flaubert has it in for. But uh, it's as though religion has been effectively done away with in, in post-revolutionary society in France. Obviously, in Ireland, this is not the case. And here, the religious bits and pieces are, are everywhere, but they, they, can't, they, they serve no purpose. Nobody can do anything with those things. Even the, the priest who's brought in at, at, in, the, in the Moran section of the book of Malloy um, is there to show that, the, that this has, no, this has no, content, no content at all, but it remains as a, as a form. Um, Nonetheless, um, something has happened to make of Malloy a kind of closed work, a kind of recontained work that has a form uh, in a way that this was resisted, it seems to me, in, uh, in Watt. Uh, and so I think one would have to be tempted to say, well, Watt in that sense is a more authentic experience of all this than Malloy. That is something... Malloy is an effort at recontainment, recoding, resymbolizing, and we'll want to look at that and see if that's really so, or see what's going on. How is it that, out of this experience of complete uh, frag fragment uh, fragmentation and, and, and schizophrenic flux that we have in Watt, how is it that anything recognizable can come again? Uh, uh, in 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 uh, anything formed can reemerge. Uh, and then we'll also want to ask how different is that form from the older modernist forms, because it seems to me that nonetheless it isn't that anymore, it is something else. Um, so that, but that is a project I think we'll leave for, for next time. The, the, the final thing I thought I'd like to say um, about this is the, the, to remind you of um, the, I think we spoke a long time ago about um, this whole concept of totality and the disappearance of, of totality as uh, an experience of external totality, of the coherence of daily life, of the transparency of the social system, 
uh, making possible unified works, or what Eagleton calls organic form, I guess. Uh, and the breakdown of this totality, the closing off of access to it by reification and so on, making then increasingly for an impossibility of, uh, of the kind of totalizing form. Now, the example I gave then, remember, was Magritte, uh, was the dialectic in Magritte between the sense that you've got objects or items, the man with the bowler hat and the umbrella. Uh, but there's nothing, what do you do with that human form? Is the human form intelligible in itself? No, it's just a funny item. I mean, what do you, it has to have, it has to have a background. A, a totality has to emerge from it to include it. Well, in Magritte, you have the sort of critique of that. And uh, the kind of conceptual part of Magritte's painting is that it says, look at these things and notice how you really, you really want to reinsert those things in a totality, but you can't anymore. Uh, and so you have, uh, you have these isolated uh, men with bowler hats um, dropping like raindrops against the, uh, against the sky. You have then these huge bits and pieces of, your, uh, of your, your toilet articles, your shaving brush and so on, uh, it's uh, larger than, than, uh, than human scale inside of, a, inside of a bedroom. Then finally you have this ultimate projection of sheer background, that is that you can't imagine concrete totalities, you can't imagine concrete contexts, let's say, rather than totalities, because the context is a kind of totalizing ensemble of, of things, a kind of gestalt form uh, around a given, uh, given object. Um, uh, you can't, you, you, you have no access to context anymore. These, these objects won't remain in context, and so they break up and become precisely items, that is, things that you can't find a context for. So out of that, you generate sort of an ultimate idea of background, and that's the blue sky. That would be the background of everything, you know, but, uh, but it has nothing to do with these things. So you have uh, the shock of the bedroom whose walls are all blue sky. That's sort of the ultimate conceivable contradictory picture of, of totality or background and then all these broken items that make up a part of it. And the Magritte painting then, uh, the whole movement of Magritte, Magritte's paintings is this kind of conceptual play with this dilemma of items, fragmentation, flux versus totality. Um, done in a very uh, highly intellectualized and woody fashion, that is, this is not an existential um, uh, presentation of the flux or of the breakdown of reification. It's rather a, a, a play with our, um, a, a very intellectual play with our categories, our impossibility to think these things anymore, the breakdown, the, the non-functioning of, of these, these categories. Well, it seems to me that that's, um, that's the problem uh, that we want to read Beckett uh, in terms of, take the body, for example, what do you do with it? Let's see, um, it walks around, uh, but then uh, if it's all by itself, if it's isolated, no background, does it sit down, lies down against the ground? Well, let's see, you can have it lie flat on its face or rain pouring down on it, you know. At uh, least uh, the schizophrenic thinks that way one side of me would be, would be dry because uh, that, that'll be the... Then you flip it over, have it lying the other way, have it lying in bed. Uh, little by little, uh, in later Beckett, you try to find a, but even a bed is another item. The hotel room is still a context. You know, how do you get, wh what do you do? Is there a place for this item, which is the body, which would not be any place, which would be, could, could, can you think of it in any non-place? Well, then we get these sort of Dantesque uh, things in, in um, um, how it is, uh, which are this sort of landscape of mud that the body is dragging itself through. That's the ultimately undifferentiated place that you can find to put this item. But we're still in a dialectic of the item versus its context, and uh, uh, blackness, night, mud, uh, but the body is still in there trying to crawl along, presumably, or, or, or whatever. Now, this is why it seems to me how we can account, because we have to account for that too, for Beckett's capacity to speak two types of aesthetic discourse. That is, uh, this is, I think, the real function of the stage for him. Because the nice thing about the stage is that it can be a no place. And the whole evolution of Beckett's theater is then towards creating uh, 
a, a scenic non-space in which the item, actor's body right there, the one tree, the one leaf, uh, the one shoe, you know, can be in a no place um, on account of theatrical convention because we understand that the empty stage is something which has not yet been filled with landscape or background or decor or context or, or whatever. So there, unlike a narrative prose where we have real problems because then immediately when Beckett gets to this uh, afterlife of the mud and so forth, then we're back in real symbolism and then it doesn't really work anymore, at least as far as I'm concerned. I mean, then, we're, then we have a kind of myth. Uh, and that's, that, that's not what Beckett uh, was there to, to do and that doesn't solve the problem, it's a kind of uh, relaxing of the problem. But on stage, on the contrary, uh, this works in some way because it's as though the, the reality of the stage, um, uh, uh, the, the, the physical reality of the stage uh, was enough of a support to allow us to imagine the placeless, uh, the non-place, where in language you've got to you, you've got to invent something first in order to, to, to do that. And the minute you invent it, you code it, and you have to call it mud, and then you're back in myths and, and stories and, and meanings and, and so forth. Uh, now, the other thing I think we can say about, um, uh, about this, uh, this whole process, and this is therefore also uh, an attempt to differentiate Beckett from, from the symbolist, from symbolist theater, for example, uh, is that uh, what Beckett invented uh, and then I think we'll stop with that. What, what Beckett invented, it seems to me, was a uh, not any of the, the thoughts about uh, death or the emptiness of activity and so on, the, the, the sort of existential side of Beckett, but rather uh, a new, I don't want to call it objective correlative, it's rather a, what Sartre calls an analogon for this process. That is, Beckett invented not an expression of existential angst, that the existentialists had done perfectly well, or Heidegger, not a symbol of existential angst, that all of symbolist writing does and, and the worst kind of poetic theater, you know, um, uh, but rather uh, an analogon that is a, an objective equivalent for this uh, concept or raw material within the reading or uh, or um, uh, within the reading process. So uh, the point about Beckett is the point about Beckett's plays is not that he's invented a new symbol for emptiness in this empty landscape and the two bums and so forth, but that he's invented an experience of the theater, which is an empty experience of waiting, waiting for the next for, for the for the next part of the story, which they start, then they drop, they forget about it, they talk about something else, then they come back to it, what were we talking about? Uh, then you get another part of it, then they forget about that and so on. And your whole experience um, of uh, this theater then becomes one of a very special kind of empty time, kind of very purely formal experience of waiting for the end, if you like, uh, which is uh, waiting for the end of the form, uh, which becomes the objective analogon in your reading or theatrical experience for what Beckett is talking about. That seems to me to be the, the, uh, the, the original thing in Beckett and obviously the, the equivalent in, um, uh, in, the, in, in the novels is what we call text or ecritura. That is the experience of, uh, of a kind of textual process that isn't going anywhere. Uh, that, that is precisely a different kind of temporal experience than anything proposed uh, uh, to us by uh, conventional uh, narrative. Uh, here in Brian Fitch's book, he calls this a kind of uh, the, the attente in, uh, in, 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 um, uh, in, um, uh, in Beckett's works, which I think is, is, a, is a good uh, description of this whole thing. Okay, and next time then we'll, um, I think then we won't have time to go on to the pension, um, uh, to the pension text uh, since we just don't have time and we'll try to do some more with uh, Watt and particularly then with um, with Malloy, which is not the book, uh, as I say, I like the best, uh, but I think it's maybe the most, um, seems to me it's with Malone dies that we get something really interesting and new, uh, a new way of putting all these things together. But Malloy is somehow more symptomatic because it represents the moment of inventing the solution to, to some of these things and so deserves, deserves closer attention.
Okay. 